Hello, hello. My, uh, gosh, my, my streaming software, Melon, is letting me down. It's froze on my intro, so I cannot see myself. I am live. Thank you. me you know what i'm able to stop it all right sorry about that melon was doing so well for a while but now i feel like i'm running into some bugs running into some bugs but hopefully we're all good uh you can see here i have a blank a blank page which hopefully we will fill with stuff <laughs> brian smith, none of these are not not brian smith none of these says people always seem to enjoy the intro so well i hope folks enjoy it took me it took me a little while to put it together i do all my own all my own motion graphic work or 90 percent of it so if you're wondering why it's so shoddily shoddily made that is why so i'm hoping we'll fill this with some good stuff i often get a lot of requests particularly about doing more hex videos hex style videos and i, I love hex crawling it's it's in my it's in the name of the channel uh sometimes though you know i confess that i feel like i i uh run out of stuff to say about it and i i i I get reinvigorated when people post stuff and, and ask for stuff. So people have asked me um, often about the aspects which I'm, I'm hopefully we'll, we'll talk about today, which is basically the kind of the basic, this is going to be more, and I couldn't find a, I couldn't think of a really good phrase. So I, I feel like the, 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 the title I chose, I think what I call basic, basic principle of play or basic structure of play is kind of bleh as a title. It's not exactly eye grabbing, but I was, uh, I was going, what I'm attempting to convey in, in, in few words was looking at the uh, moment to moment, how you would want to run hex crawl. Now, it might not be the best place. I was thinking, you know, for the title of the series and hex crawling 101 just seemed obvious. I thought, is this the best thing to start with? Shouldn't I start with making a map or doing something else? But I feel like this might be could help people because I think it might people may find it interesting or helpful or whatever regardless of where they are and you don't always need a hex map sometimes you might be playing with somebody else's map from a module or some adventure and, and maybe this will help so what i want to start with is i think most folks i want to say again feel free to interject in the chat let me know if i'm wrong i think most folks have a, have a get a pretty good understanding right away of, of if you're dungeon crawling what this i'm going to call it the board games and then call it a, a a gameplay loop this kind of what are you doing sort of moment to moment as you're playing the game so it's something like monopoly the gameplay loop would be you know going around the going around the board and potentially making those choices but essentially doing the kind of repeated actions you do right you're going around the board you're rolling the dice you're moving going around the board rolling the dice moving then maybe <clears throat> making a purchase or something but that that would be the monopoly kind of gameplay loop in a dungeon, when we think of the gameplay loop, um, we I'm going to get some text in here. Gameplay, or maybe it's one word, gameplay loop. We think of, and let me know if this type is too small. Do I need to move it around? I'm happy to zoom in, do whatever. The kinds of things we think about in a dungeon would be moving around. So you're moving, moving around. And then uh, we think about those exploration turns, or maybe I should go, maybe I should put this in reverse. So we think about first we have, right, we, we're expressing it in, in those exploration turns. Expressed in exploration terms. Let me fix my spelling here. 
those 10 minute turns, right? Expiration turns, 10 minutes. Oops, 10 minutes. And during those 10 minutes, players can, they can move, they can, you know, search or do other actions. Search, search, search and do, oh my gosh. My keyboard's my mouse, or not my mouse, my mic is just, gets in front of my keyboard. Search, do other actions, and then we've got, from our standpoint, we have wandering monster checks. Any other, you know, any other, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, like torches, torches, light, you know, resource, ticks. So th does this make sense? What I'm talking about, we're, we're looking at in a, in, if, if we're in the dungeon, we're thinking, okay, we have each hour split up into six, six kinds of, uh, we have six, six exploration turns in an hour. Every so often, every one or two hours, I'm going to check for wandering monsters, depending on the dungeon, depending on what I've decided. Every, uh, every exploration turn, that 10 minutes, I'm going to tick off, okay, you've, your, your torch or your lantern has lost a little bit of its glow it's you know you're down from six to five to four to three that kind of thing right so that's what you're doing in the dungeon and in the dungeon we talk about moving usually by the book i want to say classically of course you can do whatever you want about 120 feet for, for 10 minutes which i think is to indicate that the party's being careful trying to be quiet not necessarily succeeding but all that kind of stuff so in a dungeon in the absence of them running into a specific challenge this is this is that loop Okay, we're going to tick down another exploration turn. What are you doing? We're moving or we're searching or we're doing something. Okay, tick, tick, tick. And then there's also, you know, you put your rest period in, tick, tick, tick. Uh, Flow of the Griffin says, I find it's tough to rigidly structure the turns. <clears throat> you don't have to necessarily communicate that rigidity to your players. You can really keep it behind the screen. I have seen some games. Uh, I, I saw some games where someone was, I used to, I haven't done it in a long time, but I used to like to read play by post games. So I always found them interesting and, and fascinating and i've seen some people playing some old school games where they would literally go turn you do this wandering counter check this comes up and they were very uh, ver verbose and transparent about a turn 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 kind of down the line this was a play by post i don't know if this gm were running in person or in a live synchronous not text-based setting if they would do that as well but it, it, you might but you don't have to i don't usually do it with my players i will usually let them know okay your torch is about down to half strength or then it's sputtering. It's pretty much what I'll let them know. Or if something else is happening. I, I won't give them the rigidity. I'm just checking it off behind the screen. They're walking around. Oh, we walk to the next move. Check. Oh, we start. I want to search this book so Tick. Oh, I want to do this. Tick. Right. That's kind of what I'm doing. To them, I think on the player's side, it, it will seem, I, I feel like, and my players aren't here to, to, uh, to say that I'm lying. So as far as you all are aware, it's completely true. I think that it can be fairly smooth and flow for them and, and the rigidity is kind of behind behind the scenes. You can probably be looser if you want to. So I, I, I go into all of this. I should probably put dungeon gameplay loop. I, I go through all this because I think in reality the wilderness or hex crawling gameplay loop is not really that much dissimilar. It's just the the uh all the all the uh everything's just expanded so we can a this is something that unfortunately they didn't come up with a turn you can ex we can express it we can express it in turns i kind of like six or eight so we have 24 hours in a day in a dungeon, we're not generally concerned with people spending tw 24 hours in a dungeon. I, putting aside the idea if they want to take a long rest or sleep over in the dungeon, but essentially you're not exploring for 12 hours straight. So we're not really concerned with uh, that, kind of, that kind of rest cycle unless the party's just beaten all the heck and they need the rest for healing and, or spell resource purposes. In the, uh, in, in, in the wilderness, we are, but if you think about it, in the dungeon, you're supposed to, again, classically, there's the, you do five action, you take five exploration turns in, say, one exploration round, and then you're supposed to rest for one. 
we can think of it the same way in the wilderness, only the intervals are much bigger. The, the, we're not looking at going 120 feet. We're looking at some matter of miles, hexes, however you want to do it. And then the time, we're not looking at 10 minutes. Maybe we're looking at something like four hours. And I'm just going to use four hours here. Um, I kind of like four hours. Because... How come I got the? There we go. I like four hours because you end up getting these nice segments for the day. You can have your your morning, so whatever you want to say, like not necessarily dawn, but kind of morning to mid morning. Two, you get two, eight hours. You know, you get so you, you know eight, twelve, and so you could look at it and say, okay, well, you're going to get however many of these. Uh, we can call. Let's call it. Uh, should we call it, what, what's a good way to, what's, what do we, should we call this? We're calling this, um, I'm going to call them expedition turns. I'm probably spelling this wrong. Expedition. Let's call them expedition turns. And you can get more granular if you want. You can get more, or you can blow it up bigger. Maybe you just want to have two or three, right? Three, three things of, eight hours or you, you want to get to 24 because that's it makes it you know an hour is, is somewhat arbitrary in terms of the dungeon it's it makes sense in terms of clock time and everything but really it doesn't like what is an hour in the dungeon it doesn't really matter it's just neat because it fits in with the clock in the sense we our days if we're looking on earth-like fantasy planets which i think most people use then it just you have a complete cycle out in the world is 24 hours so we want something that fits in with uh 24 hours and we also want I like to have a little bit of granularity enough so that players can make choices to do things. Choices that uh, allow them an opportunity to do something without necessarily killing a whole day. You know? So what is an amount of time that say you could go hunt and it, it, it be an investment, but not feel like a huge waste. Four hours is good. I could see eight hours and I, I'm not a hunter and I know that you can spend all day hunting and you can set the, set the odds accordingly. But if I wanted to send somebody out and say hunt with at least some chance of success from in a wilderness camping situation four hours seems to me at least a good one is like yeah four hours you, maybe you can get something maybe it won't be enough maybe it will but okay that's four hours it's also a good chunk of time to move you feel like you're if you walk for four hours i think you're making pretty good pretty good progress but it's that same thing i'm not worried necessarily that the these times are super realistic I'm just like the 10 minutes. Someone says me just looking through a drawers in a desk takes 10 minutes. Well, realistically, if we had to stopwatch, probably not. But in game terms, yes. I just want to be close enough where we have this concept of sort of investment and, and outcome. Does it make sense that someone could hunt and catch a deer in four hours? I guess romantically, whatever. I don't, I don't deer hunt, so I don't know anything about it, but I'm going to say sure for the purposes of a fantasy game with fantasy things. Yes, yeah, sure. Four hours. Fine. Four hours, it seemed like we could make some progress on a map moving around. Yeah, sure, fine, can do that. And that's kind of all we're looking for. But in essence, it's really the same as the dungeon. So again, the kind of things that the party can do in these four-hour blocks or what, however many hours you have, they can move, they can walk, they can search or do other actions. So this could be, now, when you say search in the wilderness, maybe we're not talking about searching a chest of drawers. Maybe we're talking about searching for a landmark. We know, or we believe as the party says, you know what, I think we're in the right area. We've, we've looked at the signs, we've found the valley, but we don't know where the hidden temple is in the valley. So you know we're not really moving around, but we kind of know where we are. So now we're, we're gonna spread out and we're gonna comb the desert or sweep through the forest or, or hack through the jungle, we're not going to stop for at least four hours and, or until we find the hidden temple. Or maybe maybe we're looking for someone. Someone escaped us and we think they ran in this area. Now we're going to fan out, try to find them. Or I, I, I buried my treasure, said the pirate, and we have his treasure map, but the we, we think the X is around here somewhere, but we need to find it. That's searching. Any for, anything you want to do. Wandering monster checks. You can de de determine. I like to do once per kind of 12 hours, so, you know, for me, um, and, a, and I, I do it once per day, night, per hex, because I like the idea of some stuff being up at night, some stuff being out in the day, and some stuff being at night, but you could also just time it, just like in the dungeon with, hey, so many of these expedition turns, or maybe you could roll a die, I'm rolling for a wandering monster check. Sometimes it'll be during the day, sometimes it'll be during at night. 
so on and so forth. And of course, we also have your uh, resource ticks. These will probably be only once per 24 hour cycle, depending on your environment, but it's the same kind of thing. So once through one of these, you're gonna decide, maybe you do it every evening or you do it in the morning where you say, okay, guys, tick off one ration or two rations. However, some, you know, rations work differently. Sometimes it's three meals in a ration. Sometimes it's two meals in a ration. Sometimes a ration represents one meal. However you're doing it, iron rations or regular rations, whatever. You pick your time on one of those ticks around the loop where you're going to say, mark off, mark off a ration, mark off water if you're tracking water separately. Some games you're also tracking, I want to say Into the Word and Wild, or Into the Weird and Wild had, I think they had just kind of generic, uh, like fire making stuff so you, you might want to tick that off um let me just see here in the chat to go a bunch of stuff okay brian smith says wilderness exploration seems to naturally be broken up in units of time tied to the day night cycle as the dominant regular intervals exactly yes this is true which is something you don't have in the dungeon but but still you're kind of yeah that kind of same loop hun 78 says they're starting a forbidden lands came in this saturday so this is a little seminar is oddly well timed <laughs> i'm glad to hear it and then uh, Brian Smith asked Hunt if they played it before. They said they ran it with a bit cut off, which turns out to be a big no-no for Forgotten Lands. Everything is tied together and you break if you mess with it. Oh, I didn't I didn't know that. And then Brian Smith says the board game Root has three main time chunks, Birdsong, Daylight, Evening. I like those themes, units of time, trying to... Time, t time, tying to a specific terrain, hex, possibly. Yeah, there's lots of these. Like, I like, uh, I think for time... I like, uh, I've been dabbling around with, you know, so you have kind of morning. I kind of like something like this. Morning. Ugh. Let's just write this here. Let's go uh, time, or what do they call it? Expedition turns. Expedition turns. And then again, my spelling coming to haunt me. Actually, my spelling is usually pretty good, but not. There we go. We've got, uh, what the heck? It didn't hold. Thank you. Why do you not, I'm asking you to spell it, and you're not changing it. Okay. I kind of like morning, noontide, afternoon, dusk. Uh, let's see, did I have one more? Evening, or evening. and then night. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is kind of what I've been how I've been setting up. I think I can put some arrows here, can I? Maybe I can't. What is that? Oh, no. So I kind of like these names. They work for me, but it's the way you want to think about it. In the day, you've got your morning. We could say if you get up, uh, and I think of expedition, I think if you're moving, you're really getting up at, say, uh, you know, six o'clock, you're hitting, you're getting up, hitting the road, six to 10, morning, 10 to two, noontide afternoon two to six then you know dusk six to ten evening ten to one or two a.m and then night around something like that um fluffy the Grim says i think four hours is good enough when survival is necessary and you aren't picky more than enough time to see a few squirrels a couple deal a raccoon a turkey yes and i think that's the point is, is we're not ultimately trying to be we're not trying to simulate here right we're trying to make something that's close enough that if on the one hand, if you said to someone or someone said to you, I want to spend the morning hunting for deer and they find something, it doesn't seem like, whoa, you really, you found something? You were gone five minutes, you found something? Or the same token, if they're not successful, it doesn't seem like, hey, man, why couldn't I? Really, I was out there for a week and I didn't find a single deer? No, you're out there for four hours. Do you want to spend it? Right? The morning, you spent out there. Now it's sun is getting wherever in the sky. Do you want to keep going? Do you not want to keep going? Kind of up to you. So you want it to kind of work both ways. It should be near enough to reality so that it works for everybody and it kind of fits within the flow. That's really all we're looking for. But really, in terms of the gameplay loop, that really is pretty much it. So what I will do is in the, in they wake up and again, uh, uh, you could probably do some stuff whether you want to roll for when they wake up. I don't usually, I, I, I usually figure, especially... In, in the kind of fantastical version of this time period, people were, I think, were pretty early, pretty early risers. I mean, even now, my wife and I, especially since we have a daughter, are pretty early risers. So, you know, 6, 6.30, we're pretty much, we're up. We're up and we're 
at least semi quasi functional. So I, I give the same thing to the players. So they're basically up in that morning. What do you do? Okay, we want to we want to, you know, make breakfast or we're going to, you know, break up camp and move. Okay, fine. Like usually in camping, unless they have a really big camp, I'm not going to really take out much time for them packing up quickly, hitting the road. It's just, okay, we're moving. Now, there are decisions to be made. The overall thing, it's, hey, it's the morning. What do you guys do? Okay, well, we've been heading from here to here. We've been going northeast. Uh, you know, if I have a map or whatever it is I'm doing, okay, I'm trying to pick northeast out again, continue on our way. Let's go. Or maybe we're in town and we're, we're packing up to leave. Let's go, right? We'll go, go, uh, we're going northeast. We're following the sun, whatever it is. And then, great, right? So... That's that is they spend their four hours. So during that, what will I do in terms of how I am describing those four hours? Is I'll talk about looking at the hex map. I'll see about how far they're moving. This is when I will roll to see if they're getting lost. Are they on track? Now we're getting lost. You could use whichever rules you like, and I'm trying to keep this kind of rules agnostic, so that if you're using BX or you're using Forbidden Lands, you're using it in the Word and Wild or using something totally different. Like I don't, I'm not trying to throw a bunch of specific, uh, specific rules at you, but much like anything else, we're, we're going down there for that four hour period. If you decide that because of this environment or just in general, you're going to, you're going to have a check to get lost every, every one of our expedition turns. So every four hour kick, then you would roll once for the morning. Maybe you only want to do it once a day. I tend to try to not have a hard and fast necessary rule for it because I try to be cognizant of can the players really get lost or how much can they get lost? And I've said this before, you know, there are certain things where it, you have to just be careful with the lost thing. It makes sense to me in some terrains and not others necessarily, right? If, if you're in an open plain and, and you're heading to Mount Fuji, it's this massive mountain that you can see for a hundred miles. Can we get lost? Can we turn around? Because it's really, it's like, okay, we just keep Mount Fuji in front of us and walk. So at that point, I'm not going to roll for getting lost. Now, once we get in, say, the foothills of Mount Fuji, and maybe we had need to be in a specific part of Mount Fuji, and now if we're off, we're on the wrong flank of the mountain. We need to get to the some kind of pass or some kind of slope that is climbable, and now we're veering off. Then that's different, right? But there are some points where I just think you have to be aware of okay if i'm asking for a navigation check or i'm going to roll to get lost whatever it makes sense because the worst thing as a player is like is when it seems obvious to you that it's there you know oh it's, it's just right over there and the dm's like nope you're lost and it's like well how do how did i get lost how did i lose a mountain how did i lose it you know <laughs> how did it disappear from view so i got turned around and now i'm walking away from the mountain it doesn't really make a lot of sense if you're in the woods now Think of the Hobbit. They 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 come out of the Misty Mountains. They could see Lonely Mountain. You can't miss it. But then you get into Mirkwood, and you no longer could see the mountain. And there was that moment where Bilbo had to climb up to the top of the tree so that he could see out to get that view of the Lonely Mountain. Even then, having sighted it from being above the trees, you get down again very easy to get turned around. Now all of a sudden, okay, maybe I need to roll once every four hours. Maybe I even roll two checks for every four hours. I don't know. However you want to, however you want to do it. But you want to be careful with your navigation check so that it there's not a disconnect between the the mechanic and the and the kind of experience in the fiction, I guess is maybe ultimately what I'm blobbing around saying. So when you're moving, navigation checks if necessary, right? We're gonna narrate narrate that passage of time. Oh boy, I accidentally turned the caps on. Narrate passage of time and terrain here's where remember we're in the hex map the hexes are abstract a wood hex does not mean wall-to-wall -wall woods a hill hex doesn't mean wall-to-wall -wall hills so we gotta put on our imagination caps i like to think about places i've been or visited that kind of fit the terrain so i've been to a lot of woodlands and sort of northeast so i tend to describe them kind of like that and it's kind of hill 
wooded hills. Okay, I'll look at that. I'll look at the surrounding hexes. If we're moving from woods to plains, then I'll try to narrate that, how the, the woods are kind of slowly, if I don't know, right? If, if I know that they're kind of near the border area or, you know, if they're in the middle or at the beginning of that woods hex, they're probably not going to see much of that change yet. It's going to really depend, but I'll talk about, you know, you're seeing more grasses, maybe some more ferns, and I don't even know if it's going to totally make sense in a, if I was an Audubon field guide, it probably might make no sense at all, but I want to try to portray that change in the terrain. If there is any, if there is no change in the terrain, if they really just going, they're, they're, they're entering the woods and it's just, you know, it's deep woods for however many hexes and hexes. Then I, I will try to describe some things about it. One thing I mentioned, I forget where I might've been responding to somebody. It might've been in a video. I don't, I don't recall, but go to, go to, go to your search, your image search engine of choice. Use something. So I'm using Weehi or Weegee. I don't know. Maybe it's pronounced Weegee here for notes. Uh, there's a, a bunch of other ones like this. These kind of, I, I think Google has one that you can use. You can just go and just find images and slap them on there. So create a little board for yourself and just put all kinds of images. You know, it's winter and you know that they're in a kind of a, like a pine forest, then go find pine forest images, throw them out there. That way you can have something you can look at so that when you enter that pine forest, you can kind of pick some things out of the trees. Of course, we're usually playing fantasy games. Th feel free to throw in some fantastic elements. You can use things like the D30 sandbox guide if you want to roll up some, they call them sub, in uh, in the ready references, they call them sub hex features. Not sure what they call them in, it, or if they call them something different. I'm sure they do in the D30 sandbox guide, but those things of you helping you just fill out those kinds of details. Things like, granted your hex map should show you if there's a major river there but there may be like little streams and rills and creeks that aren't on the hex map by design because it's it's just abstracted too far remember the hex map is like you're looking down from almost a, a high flying view or dragon's eye view or a satellite view and you're, you're looking down so you're not going to have all those details in your in the hex map itself so you have to think about them so think of like creeks and 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 streams and maybe there are little hills and valleys they're not dominant enough to change the major hex feature but they're there maybe there's some little uh i don't want to say <laughs> maybe there's a chasm i mean it could be you could it could be all kinds of stuff and that's where kind of rolling on those tables is fun because you can find those and it's also those ways to insert a little bit of challenge in there if you're in the woods but they come across a big chasm what do you do? I think in the in the Wizard of Oz that happens. I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, in the books it doesn't show up in the movies for good reason. But in the books, I want to say after they after they meet up with the Cowardly Lion in those woods, they come to some massive chasm, and I think there's is it that there's yeah, and there's not even a bridge, and then some ridiculously huge monster it just starts comes out of the woodwork to chase them, and I believe the Cowardly Lion has to throw everybody across, and then I think leap across at the end, I think something like that, but. Hey, if, uh, what was his name? L. Frank Baum, maybe he was a, a super early role player, that, that role playing game uh, maker that we didn't know about, but that could be that. Hey, look, he rolled it up. Hey guys, your party, you just run across this chasm. It's 50 foot wide and looks, looks like it's super deep and it seems to run, uh, from horizon to horizon. What do you do? You can totally have those things. I've said before though, and I'll maintain if there's nothing there or the party bypasses it or does something, I would say really resist the temptation to try to pad out these clips of time. If you're in that four hours and there, it's an open prairie and it doesn't make sense, you don't roll up anything interesting and, and or some kind of obstacle and maybe you put something out there, maybe there's a wandering monster check, but it's far away and the party decides like, we're staying the course, we're not going. I wouldn't for me personally, I feel like I wouldn't force the issue because unlike in a dungeon necessarily, it's, it's, I think it's harder to, harder to hide some of that kind of quantum ogre stuff. Like, look, it's over here. Oh, we're not checking it out. Oh, now it's over here. Like what? Wait, wait, why? It just, you just, I think you'll just start to, people will, it will come become kind of transparent, I think. Um, but there might be decision points depending on the fiction either at the end of that four hour block or within one, but more likely I'll save it for the end, unless it's a big one, you know, it's like, oh, it's 
two paths diverge in the wood. Which one do you want to go on kind of thing? Or maybe there are two passes through the hills. You look and there's a valley over there and there's a valley over there, which, or you can go over the top kind of if you want to. If, and, and maybe that's meaningful in your command, then you want to give them those. You can also kind of just push them to the end of the four hours, right? Just if you want to stay within your four hour blocks and say, okay, now to the next block, I want to give them this choice. That's fine. You can kind of do that. But really, just to go back to my original point, that dungeon gameplay loop that we I, I went through at the beginning that you're probably more familiar with, it's really just that same loop with a few adjustments because now we do have the sun and weather and other things if you want to play then that's more about weather's really more about speed and say resource consumption and kind of obstacles potentially but it's really that same thing hey okay you've moved a four hour block so now we go we've they we it's been the morning it's, all right we're moving northeast great the, the, this is happening okay let's say oh you're in the woods it's a calm spring morning. I've rolled for weather and stuff, so I know it's kind of mid-spring. All right, it's a cool, cool morning. There's a a little bit of a wet breeze, a little bit of moisture on the air coming from the east. You're in this pine woods. There's a nice smell. There's really still a lot of thick needles on the floor that crunch beneath your feet. You can see in the distance where the, the trees just begin to spread out more and more and you could see a little bit more brush and things where they're finding sunlight as, as as the trees are diminishing and even even at their heights as you're looking the heights seem to be gradually getting getting uh, smaller and smaller and finally you could see that you're coming to the end of the forest and spreading out in front of you is more of an open plain you get that smell of wild flowers seems to come into your ears there's a little bit more buzzing of insects here it is still spring but some of the grasses have begin have begun to rejuvenate or regrow i don't know whatever whatever the word is and now i'm looking at okay so now you're kind of coming out of this area what's our next step and this step could be oh great right now we i don't know where they're going assuming that this is not the destination the party didn't say great we we've come to the edge of the woods let's turn around and go home <laughs> which might be Fair enough, party, you, you go back the way you came. But now we've, if we start off in the morning, now we're in that noontide area and now it's okay. What are, what are you doing now? And it may very well be like, okay, great. We continue, we continue forth. And now I can talk about that. Now I can talk about that. Now I will talk about the planes and how that's going. If I'm a member in this gameplay loop, I, if, 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 if I can, I've rolled for some wandering monster checks early. I like to roll for them early so that I can think about, and I, I might, what I sometimes do is I'll roll and then I'll roll a, a D6 and I'll, that way I can place it. So let's say I rolled and there is going to be a wandering monster that I may roll D6. Maybe I'll get two, which would indicate, okay, it's coming in that noon time hour. So now that when I'm describing the open planes, I can start to think about what did I roll it's coming at this part of the, part of the, their journey. How far away is it? So, you know, and how does that make sense? Now, again, with, we have to take into account, it's good to roll for distances, which I really will, but we also can count. Now I'm in open planes. So if the distance I got was 30 feet or something, or whatever, the 30 yards, maybe something like that. And I don't want to think about, well, how did they, how'd they get that relatively close on the wilderness scale? without the party knowing it. So I want to think about that too, or I want to amend it. You know, I got a group of goblins and, and it's it's 90 goblins are here, but then I rolled, somehow they surprised the party and they're, you know, I don't know, like I said, 30, 30 yards away, 120 feet. I'm like, huh, how, how do you manage that? Well, maybe they've got an illusionist. Who knows? Maybe, they, maybe, they've, uh, maybe they've constructed a big painting of open prairie that they painted like Wile E. Coyote that looks... Uh, just like the rest of the planes, and then they they drop it at the last minute and charge forward. I don't know what it would be, but I want to think about it. And if it just doesn't make sense to me, and I'm going, these goblins don't have a high level or whatever illusionist to make a large enough illusion to hide 90 of them, or whatever it is, then I'll go, okay, okay, I got to push them back or do something else or figure out another way. Maybe 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 90 of them are not that close, but some scouts are, and those scouts can duck down into the tall grass and do a better job hiding. And the 90 are somewhere further away, but they're all part of the same overall group, whatever, something like that. But I want to think about these things so that 
when I'm coming here now, if I'm talking about, okay, now you're getting into these grasslands and the grasses are still mostly brown, but you can see some, some green starting to come forth. You can see some little flowers starting, the buds starting to open a little bit and some of that color. And I will talk about, well, the grasses maybe to you, if they're, you know, mostly humanoid and not are human or humanish in size, and males, okay, it's coming up to your, maybe your mid thigh or your waist and oh, where there's a dwarf. So, okay, maybe up to your chest, something like that. So then if I want to talk about goblins surprising them, at least I can say they jump out of the tall grass. If I, if I narrate the place, like it's manicured, like a golf course, <clears throat> excuse me, let me get a swig of watered down grape juice for the working man. If the place has grass that's mowed down and manicured like a golf course, and then I have goblins pop up, I got to explain it. So, you know, you just want to make sure it makes sense. But I'm just going to narrate through that. Okay, now you're you, you're moving another four-hour stretch. I usually will have them stop for lunch. I don't usually deduct it too much. My numbers for travel are very fuzzy, and I like the fuzzy numbers. So I, I will see people try to get into the weeds on doing all the calculations. I don't, I don't care about all that because they're not, no one there has a kind of GPS or even a, a, a step counter to figure out exactly how far they are. So I just, I, I allow all these gray areas of, Hey, some days you're a little bit faster. Boy. Yeah. you thought like you were walking fast, but maybe you weren't, maybe, maybe you were the road, the, the path you took was more circuitous than you thought, or you just weren't making as good progress as, as you thought. I keep it nice and fuzzy. And that way, if in one day they dig a little further, or whatever, but it kind of fits, I'm able to to get the mechanics to fit right. I'll just I'll flub the fiction a little bit. It doesn't it doesn't matter that much, right? No one no one has the ability to be super precise with their counting. We're not we're not even wearing watches. We're looking at a if there's a sundial somewhere you can look at. Maybe that's great for the most part. People are just kind of eyeballing it. So I'm not terribly you know picky picky about that stuff. I'll just kind of narrate. I have them stop for lunch. And because my numbers are fuzzy, I'm not interested in, well, that 10 minutes for lunch. Did lunch take up this much? I, I don't care. It's, it's, it's the, the numbers are fuzzy enough and flexible enough throughout the day that if a few minutes from each one, we pull it together and call that lunch so we can make our accounting nice and clean without having to have like a, a weird, uh, it doesn't take four hours to eat lunch and I wouldn't want them. So, okay, you ate lunch. Now suddenly it's nighttime. What? The sun's gone down. The sun's gone down while you cook lunch. Uh, no. So, uh, but I'll, I'll factor in that stop for lunch. And what I'll usually do also when we have the lunch stop is it's also another way for me to kind of reset. It doesn't fit cleanly into the turns, but I don't really care. I, what I really care about is I have a chance to kind of reset what's going on. If they have any things, it's kind of, it's also their opportunity to kind of reset a little bit if they want to. Other than that, it's next four hour chunk. Here's what's happening. Next four hour chunk. And as things are going, right? Okay, if it's dinner and I'm ticking off your your rations at dinner time, we'll tick that off now. All right, so what are we doing? We're prepping up camp. That to me, I don't mind is kind of a four hour thing, the sort of prepping and getting ready of camp and doing stuff. You, we can put that as 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 part of like that. That what are you doing at dusk, right? We can we can fit a few things. All right, we're prepping camp, we're cooking, cooking a meal, we're doing that stuff. And you, you kind of put all that out and say, okay, that's our, and we're, you can also lump in if you want to, you're kind of, depending on how you, if you want to narrate the stuff or not, your, I don't know what you call them, downturn-ish actions or the stuff like, oh, well, all that stuff that people will factor in. No, 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 no. The reason why this doesn't happen is because we're, you know, whenever we're not, whenever we're not moving, we're constantly sharpening our weapons and cleaning, you know, and oiling the blades and, and making sure our bow strings are, are in good order and that our, our bows are nice, right? All that stuff that can factor into, okay, now dusk or, or whichever time they do it, that's one block. You can lump all that together, all your kind of camp prep, camp prep, food prep, maintenance, boom. That's kind of one block. And then you have two left over, in this case, evening and night mostly. And those are who's taking your watches. Do you want to, you know, and then it's to me, a lot of times two guys from my party will just take one watch or that'll usually split into three. I don't, you know, again, in terms of the turns, I don't care that much. It's if it, they can kind of do that. But in, in terms of my accounting, I'm just counting it as two, two turns. But if they want to have one, essentially, you know, one takes each, split those two turns into three for their own thing. That's fine. And then that's kind of your eight hours sort of standard rest. And then 
get up and do it again until you get to where you're headed. Um, anything in the chat? Am I not scrolled? I don't think I'm scrolled up. Oh, there's a, oh my gosh. Oh, bunch of stuff here. All right, let me, let me, I thought I was updating the chat and I was wondering, wow, chat seems quiet. And I realized I had scrolled up and never looked back. All right, let me try to see. Here's where I think I was. Okay. Brian Smith says, taking watch of the common breakdown of exhibition turn two seems like the timer. It, it really does. But I have three players taking watch. So then it's just a matter of basically two players. It really is that two players end up on each each turn, right? It's just if we have A, B, and C on the first turn of watch, really I have two players A and B. And then on the second watch, I have B and C. And then at some point, you know, during the, in the middle there, kind of B drops off, right? That's basically it. They don't need to be aware of it. They can just be like this much later, but you know, this much later and you wake up so-and-so and they take the watch. But for me, I'm just looking at it as, as two, as two, two turns. If it was something that if I'm like, you know what? I just can't, this mismatched expectations. I just can't, can't do it. Or I don't want to do it. Then just say, Hey, we're going to do two watches, four hours each. Do it that way, which I think is totally, would be totally fine to me. Brian Smith says three day units, three night units. I might try just to mark them off as we play. Yep, I, I think it works pretty well. And then Hans78 says, so try to hide the mechanics a bit so it feels less turn based from the player's perspective. Yeah, I don't need to. Uh, it's So, Hun, I wouldn't say hide it. I just don't show it. There's no reason to show it, I guess. And I'll usually just say something like, well, it's lunchtime. You know, it's, the sun has reached the top of the sky or the height of its, the height of its arc for the day. Uh, and so I, I kind of marking it off. Um, and, and just like in the dungeon, I don't need to show them. I mean, if they wanted to, if they wanted to be super intent and ticking off those things, I would do it. I just don't express it to them in now it's this turn. Now it's that turn. I'm just doing that in my, in my head. Price business halflings always wake up last. Hey, Terrence, Terrence just got up. Maybe Terrence is a halfling. Could be. Do players have a hex map, a simple hap map, or none, no map at all, Hunt asks. I don't give them any kind of map, or maybe I'll give them a simplified map. My current game, I gave them a very, very simple map, impressing to them the lack of scale and everything. I really just wanted to show them where a couple of the towns were. Um, and because it was it was known, it's not unknown, It was this is like where they are is really pretty highly civilized or settled, I should say. So... It was like, yeah, you know, you know these towns. I generally don't really give out much maps. I definitely don't give them out the hex map. Um, maps are great rewards. They're great things to find in chests. In fact, you will, I believe, in at least originally in the white box, maybe in BX as well, is something you could roll in your random treasure tests was treasure maps. And these should be great, very non, non-accurate or just its accuracy is not even really the point kind of mass, but just give folks a taste of what's out there. I certainly don't give them my, you know, accurate or sort of GM maps. That's stuff for them. If they express interest, make it something you can get. Oh, you, you, you want that? Well, the, the Duke's got maps, but he's not going to give them out for free. So what are you going to do for the Duke? Or maybe you can hire a surveyor to draw you some, or carto cartographer to create some maps, and that can be a mission. I'm, I'm, I'm in the kind of like, my mode as a GM is kind of barter town. Nothing's for free or very little. Nothing's for free. You know, they want it. I'm happy for them to go get it. I do not give it to them. Uh, and Brian Smith speaking. Yeah, we did talk about this last time. Yeah, the GMs basically have full hex map. Of course, you got to have your tools, but the players, not so much. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Just scroll through chat, so apologies if I'm not yapping, yapping, yapping. But if the Griffin says, in my opinion, my players aren't cartographers. With everything being abstract imagination, it's very difficult to convey distance and terrain. Maps help, help bridge the gap. They can. Absolutely can. I mean, look, it's always kind of a, you know, we could preface everything by saying, your models may vary you know, with your players and your experience and how you like it. I found that my players have done pretty well. I think it helps if it's if, if they're doing it enough or I, don't, I want to say do it a lot, but like my players have been romping around this particular part of the countryside for a while now. So they know pretty well, have a good idea, the kind of distances and things and how long things take, which is, which is good. Um, 
I haven't, I mean, my own self, I haven't had necessarily troubles with just narrating it. But again, people, some people are very used to their tools. I mean, it would be really interesting to think about it. There were some ways to bridge that to, to, because I think there is something that you lose when you don't have that discovery kind of unknown, when you just kind of see the map out in front of you. By the same token, you know, you can look out again, go to a high, I think we talked that last time, or, or it might've been my, uh, the hex crawling Q and a about, Hey, we only have, you only use three hexes, but I'm like, well, what if you get to a high point and just look around what happens after those three hexes? Right? So just, you just gotta, you gotta balance it. I've had good experience with doing, uh, just theater of the mind and then having them earn a map. But again, that's something you can do is give them a map, but have them earn it and have it be up to them to really keep it up to date and put things on it. Or if they don't want to do that part of it, then you can put things out there. It can give them, you want to call it adventure hooks or opportunities to have people in the game fictionally able to update that map for them, right? Cartographers, uh, nobles, people in the military, wizards and other sort of researchers and, and people who hoard knowledge will have maps so that you could say, oh, you want to upgrade your map or you want to get more to the map or you find our map lacking. Well, the so-and-so over there might be able to do it. But again, what are you going to do for them? My thing is, uh, you know, again, is I, I give nothing for free. And, and my players kind of know that and act accordingly. Let's see. Ryan Smith said, uh, my players quickly tire of the loop of DM describes landscape. Players say we continue before. It feels like something they would want to skip past. Maybe they aren't Hexcrawl fans, though. Uh, yeah, so you can certainly, I, I think, that's where you have to kind of read the room in your descriptions, which is not really dissimilar from when you're in a dungeon, right? You're in a dungeon and there's a really long corridor and you spend the first minute and you're saying this whole description of 10 feet. And then the players are like, okay, but we keep moving the rest of the, it looks like it's 100 feet to the next thing, so we just move the 90, 90 feet. Or you could keep saying, oh, but then in the next 10 feet, da -da, and then the next 10 feet. And, and, but at some point, hopefully you read the, the, the glazed over looks on your players' faces and you go, okay, 90 feet later, you get there. And you should be open to doing that in the hex crawl too. If I'm looking at it, I'm kind of narrating through and I'm doing this stuff and I'm seeing like, well, we don't care or we don't have to, we don't have time to worry about this stuff, then just, you know, jump ahead. If there's nothing there, if the things, and we'll do in another video, I'll get into more of the kind of obstacles, opportunities, the kind of those putting in features and, 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 and those uh, things that you can, besides creatures that you can put in your hex crawls, hopefully make them interesting. But the, at the end of the day, even if you put something, look, you know, you're, you're, you, you enter the open plains and to one side, you see this amusement park of wonder and lights are spinning and signs are beckoning you to enter and your players go, I want nothing to do with that. We run the other way. Then you just got to go with it. Right. And I, and I think that's where I kind of mentioned earlier about don't, don't force it. If, if, if they're just moving along ahead and you put some things in front of them and either they overcome them quickly or they just don't care about them yet. Yeah, don't, don't drag them. Because I think what happens is the GM gets in their mind saying, okay, my party's going to be traveling from A to B today. That's going to be this whole session. I've, I've figured it out. My session tonight is going to be a party travel from A to B. And then you get in the session and you get at some point, you go, oh my gosh, we've been playing for 10 minutes. And if I don't do something, they're going to get to A to B in 10 minutes and another 10 minutes. And I'm going to have nothing prepped because I didn't prep anything because I thought we're going to be hex crawling today. You know, it's a bad, don't do that. Because then what you end up doing, which I've seen DMs get into is, well, look, every hex or every so often, they're going to run to an encounter and this and that. And then it feels like a monster corridor. It feels like, it doesn't feel like a hex crawl anymore. It doesn't feel like your choices matter. It feels like you're just marching from one thing to the other. And that kind of, I feel like that undermines the beauty, the beauty of the hex crawl. So yeah, if your party's just motoring along and there's nothing there to stop them or slow them down and they're not interested in smelling the, the flowers as they go by, then just move it much again, like you would in a dungeon, if you're in a big corridor or something else and you find yourself wanting to want to describe stuff, the party's like, we move on. Well, you know, they open a door to a room and you want to describe this beautiful room and the party's like, yeah, we close the door and move on. All right, close the door and move on. Um, Hun, oh yeah, talking about my goblin thing. Sounds like an ambush. Yep, pretty much. Hun says that's their problem too. The group is used to a dialogue, so having monologue gameplay is foreign to us. It doesn't have to be a monologue either. I think oftentimes it can be uh, depending, again, depending on what's going on. It doesn't, 
you know, I keep going back to it. It's like, what what would you do in the, the dungeon? Like, what do your players talk about when they're in the dungeon? Because there's a certain part of the dungeon where someone may be taking point. You're going left, right, center, left, left, right, straight, left, right, straight. Listen to door, don't listen to door. Uh, left, right, straight, upstairs, downstairs. It's the same kind of thing. And it can also get old, old quickly. I think hopefully your your party engages with it. And if they're not, right, I think this thing, if they're not, if you're like, I really want to hex crawl my party and they're just not loving it, they're not digging it, they're not doing anything, then yeah, skip it. Skip it. And I think also look at the scale. Look at what you're, you're doing. If it makes more sense to say like, look, we're traveling months going across the continent, then maybe doing four hour blocks isn't the proper scale. And six mile hexes, let's say, or five or six mile hexes aren't the scale. We need to do 32 mile hexes and each day is one turn. And that's the scale we're looking at. So you have that that capability. Another sip of watered down grape juice for the worker man. You have that capability, you have that flexibility, which you don't generally get in the dungeon unless you're gonna say, we just go down three levels, okay. To, to use the scale that works for the level you're looking at. My players are generally traveling within a couple of hexes. They're not going a super long way. So that four hour thing, I think works for me. It works for me, I think when you're doing, okay, it's gonna take us a couple of days to get there. I feel like those are good decision points. If we're talking about we're going across the world, then it may not work, especially if there's not gonna be interesting decision points within that kind of granularity. But the best thing is, the great thing is you can just zoom out and say, all right, we're not gonna, whoop. We're going to do a week is one, you know, where a day is a turn and a week is a thing. And we're going to go from that point. I mean, you have, you have the power. You have the power. Uh, let's see. Hun says, the more decision points I can cram in there, the better. So pre-rolling possible encounters is probably required for me. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Do whatever you need to. I Pre-rolling encounters, pre-rolling some of those subhex features. Think about what they what they mean. Put them together. You, you, there is some kind of enticement of your players. If they're on, and the thing is, you have to also honor whatever the players are doing. If your players are, or if the mission is like, we got to get, we got to get there in forty eight hours, or the princess, or the prince, or the king, whatever dies, then they're not going to have time for side hustles, and they're not going to want side hustles, and they shouldn't. They're playing in the game, and the game dictates. Yeah, we don't have time for this. We got to get to the place or Robin Hood's going to get executed. You know, we got it. We got to get there, but we got to move. We don't have time for, uh, you know, standing stones or, or weird beckoning voices from the fog. But on the other hand, if they're looking for the next dungeon to explore, then suddenly, oh, those standing stones, that could be, there could be something there. Oh, voice in the fog. What's in the fog. Maybe there's, maybe there's something there that we can investigate. Right. So we got to keep in mind, we got to honor and make sure we're keeping in mind what the what are the goals? What are the characters? What are the players trying to accomplish? Because if they're trying to just do speed, then trying to entice them with obstacles or opportunities is not going to be something that's going to appeal to them unless those opportunities or obstacles directly impede that speed. So throwing something off to the side and saying... Uh, Ooh, do you want to check out this funky looking tower? It's like, no, we got to go get the princess. On the other hand, if there's a pass through the hills and there are bandits that have set up a roadblock there, now you've suddenly set up something that is, and they, they need to get back, they need to get through there one way or another. Now there may be an interesting decision point. Wait a minute. We got bandits. How many bandits are there? Can we pay them? Do we have the money to pay them? Do we want to pay them? That would be the easiest way, but maybe if we pay them, they'll still mess us up. But if we go around those hills, I don't know where the next best pass is. We get lost. Do we pay? Do we not pay? Right there's something that they're suddenly going to be intrigued by. So you have to kind of look at what's going on. And if something's not there, it's not there. Don't just try to keep pushing them. Like, no, wait, the tower. Look, the tower. It's calling you. It's like, no, I don't want that. I want your damn tower. Leave me alone, tower. You know, it, it, you know, you could, of course, add magic into it. And, you know, if maybe the tower just keeps following you now or something. Or may, maybe you end up in this kind of weird uh, magnetic pull of the tower until you figure it out. You can't get past. That might be interesting, too. But, you know, you want to be careful with that stuff that could be considered kind of railroady. Uh, so, you know, moderation, right? Ian said, I thought the first rule of hex crawl was not to yell to tell your players they're in a hex crawl. <laughs> I mean, I don't. So Ian, to Ian's point, I do not tell my players, you are now in the hex crawl 
portion of the adventure, which I think I mentioned, well, uh, it might have been in the, I think it was in the one of those OSR Reddit roundups where somebody asked to differentiating hex crawling from dungeon crawling. I think my first thing was, why am I doing that? Like, I don't want it to feel that way. I just want to feel like they're doing the same same things, only just because of the context, we're just talking different chunks of time. Instead of moving in an hour and doing things in 10 minutes, we're doing things in, so, in four hours, that kind of thing. Uh, and I'm talking about the map says from the islands comes with this giant map where even the dungeons are noted and it was bugging me. Yeah. I don't know if, I, and, and you can read through there. I read through there a while ago, actually on stream. And I never finished. Um, some games, I think they want to make it more forward player facing where all the dungeons are. It's nice for the dun for the players to know something's out there. So I don't mind. I, I think I mentioned in one of those streams that I gave my players in another game, a map that had, they earned it through adventure. So again, nothing for free, but they earned it through an adventure and it had a couple of dungeons listed on there, but only kind of the names in a way that made it sound like it was kind of mysterious, like Den of Thieves, question mark, you know, Cave of Thieves, I think it was called. And and it was just kind of there to entice them and like, ooh, ooh, what, what, ooh, what, is, the, what is the Cave of Thieves like? That kind of thing, which gave them ideas of where to go and also choices. Uh, let's see, Matthew Cashman says, how densely do you stock the map with locations? Um, all right, so I do kind of like the, hey, one thing in your six mile hex, one interesting thing in a six mile hex, remember six, six mile hex is 30 some odd square miles. So the idea there might be one interesting thing in 30 some odd square miles, it's not from that kind of standpoint, it's like, oh, that's, that's not too crowded. And then it could be something hidden. It could be something, it could be a location. It could be a person. It could be a creature. It could be, it could be kind of anything but I, I think I want to make it kind of interesting. I want to make it sort of worthwhile to find if it's if it's found. And so I kind of like that. And then depending on what the terrain is and where they are, you can determine whether they accidentally find it. S certainly if they go searching for it, they'll probably find it. If you're on if you're in a plains hex and there's a tower, they're gonna see it from miles away unless there's something really, you know, something obscuring it. So then you have just kind of down to the expert to the investigative parts of it. But I've also said before, which is if you don't have it or you don't feel like it makes sense then don't put it in there, but you can just kind of make it plain to your characters to declare that it's kind of empty, right? Cause I don't want them just searching for nothing. So if, 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 if it seems this is plainly like planes and there's 30 miles of planes and nothing in it at all, then I'll try to make that fairly clear. Okay, Fluffy the Griffin says, I think the biggest disconnect for me is I'm a perma DM and I've never seen a hex crawl played over the shoulder of another DM. So it'd be cool one day to see something like that played out. Fluffy the Griffin, I hear you and people have asked if if I if my group were like, if I had like a YouTube group or we were we were streaming our games, I would totally, I would totally do one. I mean, it would probably be at least an aspect, a preferred aspect. My my group, my group is not not that. And I'd been thinking about well, if I was going to. Maybe I'll think about it because I'm thinking about, well, if I was going to do that, how could I do that? How could I literally play one out? Um, I don't know. Maybe I, it's it's hard to kind of mock or do one because then you don't get the... The nice thing with seeing a live play is that you get to see not only when things go exactly according to how the GM or how you think it would go, but how the... How, when, when, when things go differently, you know, when when the players decide to chase after something that was just a little flavor detail... Or there is something major and the players decide not to. And then we could, you know, talk about it afterwards, have kind of a, a debrief on, hey, here's what I thought they were going to do. Here's what they did. Here's how I handled it. Um, I'm not sure if there's really a, a way to mock it up to make it useful since I don't have that kind of game. Maybe it's someone I'll, I'll get there where I'll be able to do that or, or we can, if somebody, if somebody knows, if somebody knows, there's so many live plays on, on Twitch and YouTube. I find it hard to believe that nobody's done any kind of hex crawling, but maybe, I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to figure that out. I got, I got a bolt. So this will be the end of episode one. I'm just going to close that off. Um, I hope this people found this useful. It wasn't too rambly. Um, I hope it made, made sense what I was trying to express, which is basically, in some sense, really leveraging your dungeon crawl skills in the hex crawl, just adjusting for the different different uh, lengths of time and distance that we're talking about. Really, a lot of the steps don't change a whole lot. Now, the descriptions are different. 
and there are a couple, a couple of different things and we have got that that day night cycle we have to take account of but i'm hoping that if you kind of drill down right you 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 do like it uh what was that uh oh shit i was gonna think of that, that jim carrey movie where he's living in the artificial world right the the you you go into the control room that's this window that's behind the sun you know that that you can kind of look at that stuff and you can you don't your players don't have to see that they just see the world right but you can as a gem you can take advantage of the gears and the mechanics and these spreadsheet or something we're like okay we got if 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 that helps you for your prep and making it run smoothly or you can fly by the seat of your pants if you like to but hopefully that made sense for the griffin uses one note oh cool yeah I, i've messed around with one note there's so many excellent tools out there but yeah one note one note definitely works uh I will be more with these. Do me a favor. If you have ideas of stuff you'd like to see, let me know in the comments. I've also got uh, a forums. You can hop in there and do that. You could ping me on Twitter, Facebook, wherever. Let me know what kind of stuff you'd like to see. I do hear you on trying to do an example. I wish I just had a a, a, a sort of public facing group to do that. Uh, hex calling for one shots is kind of weird, but maybe I could put something together Maybe maybe get Terrence or somebody to help me out who's who's uh, done some games and stuff, and we could figure out how to do some kind of little little mock up to kind of put this uh, uh, take this from from sort of just a, a, almost an academic discussion to something. Haha! This is this is how it plays. And uh, oh wait a minute, Ian says, do I have an interest in large scale faction pet play? Sure, I, I love I love me some factions, absolutely. Hun says, I have a weakness for mule skin notebooks. Do you really mean mule skin or was that mole skin? Because <laughs> mule skin, I feel like I need to add that to my random things you might find in a dungeon. Uh, mule skin, a mule skin notebook. Uh, let's see. Ben Milton did a did dungeon crawl exam example with game master notes interspersed, but that was dungeon crawling. I'll have to figure it out. We'll have to, we'll have to figure something out. We'll, we'll, we'll keep in mind. We'll figure something out. Maybe we can even do... I don't know. We'll figure it out. Something, something I'll keep in the back of mind. It would be cool to do. Uh, maybe they meant moleskin. <laughs> maybe. And think even moleskin. It's like, is it the skin of a mole? Because uh, that's that could be a little bit disturb, disturbing too. Skin of a mule? Skin of a mole? I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to figure that out. All right, folks. Again, I hope this was useful. Let me know. The comments shower me with praise or disdain whichever you like if you enjoyed this or didn't enjoy this let me know what you'd like to see more of i will be thinking of what to do in episode two i kind of i mean i'll do as many of these as we can find things to talk about i don't have an upper scale or lower scale limit in the amount this will be and then when it should move on to more to hex crawling 201 with the more advanced topics i don't know we'll see uh truman show yes bob monsel thank you i was thinking of the truman show but anyhow, have a great rest of your day or night or whenever you are watching or listening to this. Uh, yeah, game on, everybody, and uh, I'll talk to you later.